Welcome back to Cabarabia, my monthly rumination on all things relevant to the world of cabaret and the nightclub experience. Every program, I profile and interview the leading performers, composers, musicians, producers, and venue owners, all the people that bring you live performances in intimate settings. And welcome back. Welcome back to my little podcast that could, Cabarabia, uh, my monthly rumination on all things relevant to the nightclub experience. And uh, I'm so very excited to share this show with you. First of all, we're going to feature two of my very favorite people in the entire universe. And we're going to talk about the pioneer of alternative comedy, Uncabaret. We have the High Priestess of Uncabaret, Beth Lapidus, and her musical director and producing partner, Mitch Kaplan. And uh, we're going to start out here with a little video package. <laughs> Going to get you on Cabaret and just bearing your soul. I'm too private for what I said today. I won't say anything that isn't 100% true. It's a communal experience expressing itself in the moment of the show. Hello, and welcome to the Uncabaret. I'm Asian, my husband's white, our son is black. We, when we walk down the street, we cause what I call the what the fuck triangle. <laughs> it's like people are literally like. <laughs> when I enter a room, I don't even want to look at people because I don't want to get that look. <laughs> Fucking naked on my bed, covered in chocolate. Oh, I can't masturbate off the grid. <laughs> oh, come on, Beth. I'm a big faggot. Maybe even I know this. <laughs> What's coach pitch? Is this a sport of some kind? Yay! Well, I'm very excited for this show. It's sort of like it's sort of like being home with my little friends here. Uh, please welcome, please help me welcome Beth Lapidus and Mitchell Kaplan. Hello! Hi! Hi, uh, everybody! Hi, everybody! Uh, you've got three nighttime people that are here in the day, talking to them in the daytime today. Um, Beth, let's start with you giving us, you know, you have a, you have a story that you tell about how Uncabaret was conceived, and I think that's a good place to start telling our story. Um, on Cabaret, well, thanks for, you know, thanks for digging into On Cabaret and having us, and uh, it's lovely to see you in this time. Um, I was doing a show called Globomania at a place, a small uh, art space called the Women's Building, and uh, it was a little, the well, audience was laughing a little harder than they should have. I mean, you sort of know how funny your things are. And at the end of the show, I said, it wasn't quite as funny as you thought it was when it was the last time you laughed. And they said, oh, we don't laugh. We're women and we're artists and we're lesbians. And when we go to comedy clubs, they just make fun of us. So I said, well, I'll make you a show. It'll be unhomophobic, unxenophobic, unmisogynous. It'll be uncabaret. And it really was a download. I hadn't thought of that word. I don't know where it came from. I wasn't really a cabaret person. I was a performance artist. I'd never really been to cabaret ever. I mean, I'd seen the movie. Um, 
uh, as I say, with my with my gay boyfriend and his boyfriend. Um, so it was a little bit of an immersive experience. But um, but you know, of course, it didn't come from nowhere. It was a download. But you know, I was primed for it. I'd been working in the comedy clubs. I had been at the comedy store one night following Andrew Dice Clay, and he was doing his you know misogynist material, and the audience was laughing. So I was angry at them, and I was angry at him, and I was angry at myself for being angry and so after that I thought okay there's got to be a better way and that I have a long history with that idea but um, once that seed was planted in my head I had sort of my eye out for what would be the better way and then you know one day the better way just you know was given to me and um, I didn't exactly know what it meant to you know do on cabaret and um, many years of exploration and invention have followed (laughs) Uh, Beth, do you remember how you and I met? Um, nope. I'll tell you. Uh, we, we both used to work occasionally at a cute little club in Hollywood called the M Bar, and uh, there was a there was a situation that arose where um, uh, I I needed a specific time in, of rehearsal in the daytime. Mm-hmm. And you had custody of that block of time. Mm-hmm. And I had known who Was you I were. Was I nice? Did I let you have it? Well, that's my... I had known <laughs> who you were. And, you know, you're a very acclaimed cult figure at that point. And, um, and, and I very timidly called you and I said, I need... Can I have the time? And you were extremely gracious. Oh, look at and me. And we've been big friends ever <laughs> since. Look at and, me. <laughs> and uh, and then I want to bring Mitchell into this. I Mitchell is probably one of the people I've known longest since I've lived in L.A. straight out of college. He doesn't like me to put any years on it, but um, it's been quite a few few many years. And Mitch used to be the uh, main musical director at the at the back lot at the Studio One, very famous, epically famous club. And Mitch was the main uh, person there. And uh, I was his hugest, biggest fan, and we became friends. And um, Mitch, for many years, has been the chief collaborator and musical director for Sandra Bernhardt for, well, in, in ever since basically King of Comedy, right? Didn't you meet Sandra right after King of Comedy? 1985. Yeah, and started doing gigs with her then. So anyway, so Mitch and I had been friends for many, many years, and then when I crossed paths with Beth, uh, I had said, you know, the, uh, you guys are such kindred spirits. You, you two belong together. And uh, I'm happy to say I was the person that sort of match made you, which was something yes. that... Um, yes, very grateful for that. Uh, ...worked well. And, um, and so tell me a little bit about how you decided to revive... Um, on Cabaret. You hadn't done it for a period of time. And uh, then you decided to put it together with Mitch, uh, bringing a musical element to it. So tell, tell me a little bit about that evolution. Well, um, it, we ran for many years. People should know that. We ran, you know, at many venues. We had many residencies. We were on Comedy Central. We were, did, you know, on Audible, blah, blah, blah. A lot happened. And then uh, I thought, what about that Beth Lapidus? She's got some other things to do. And uh, we made a show that I guess we'll talk about uh, as, as this show unfolds, called 100% Happy 88% of the Time. And uh, Clifford and Mitch and I, and... Um, And then uh, somebody that Mitch and I knew said, oh, I'm working at this venue and they need shows and maybe you guys could do something. And we were like, sure. When we went down there and um, and it was the most beautiful, hidden, secret room in Los Angeles. It was in a weird location. Um, There was not a door on the street. It was inside another venue. And they were having trouble bringing people in because nobody knew about it. And they said, all right, do you want to do something? And they were, you know, going to pay us to put something up there, which is a very sweet offer for Los Angeles. And I started thinking, like, oh, we could do, like, Playtime with Beth and Mitch, and we could do this, we could do that. And then Mitch said, like, let's do on Cabaret. And I said, no, 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 no. That show's dead to me. I'm never doing that show again. That show is, I mean, I gave everything to that show. And... um and Mitch said, well, let's just do one for your birthday. 
And I said, and he said, everybody loves it. And I was like, oh, all right. He got me with the love. And, um, and he said, I'll do it. We'll do it together. It'll be fun. We'll be doing more music. And so I said, all right, we'll do one for my birthday. And then uh, we ran in that venue for seven years until they closed. So, And then there was more story, but that's how we started. That, that was that. There was magic around it, which was a friend had given me a card that said hope one way. And uh, I was in a sort of a, 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 a moving around period of my life. And I brought that card with me everywhere. And when we went outside after we said yes, we noticed that the club was on the corner of First and Hope Streets. And it was actually called First and Hope. So it was the tiniest vision board. Um, and that's the little bit of magic story around starting up again. And then Mitch and I um, came together in that venue to create a, sort of a V.2 version of Uncab. Uh, it had a lot of the same elements, story-based comedy, confessional, in the now. Most Those were the most important things. Voices of difference, a lot of women, LGBTQ, AI, um, and uh, very intimate, very conversational. But Mitch's, um, besides the music, uh, and Mitch, of course, you can pipe in, but here would be what I would say. Mitch and I have overlapping, but of course, we're different people, not the same taste. And Mitch's taste is maybe a little more uptown. Mitch would be maybe a little bit quicker to say that person went on too long. Um, you know, and, and Mitch's, I, I think, you know, Mitch's taste really helped bump the show up to maybe a, a, we were at 2012 at that point uh, or 2013. And, you know, the world was moving faster and there was social media now. And, the, and, and on top of that, the music and the music elevated, you know, live music, obviously, we always had recorded music. You can't do a show without any music, but, um, the live music and Mitch's amazing artistry elevated the vibration in the room and we really became about fine-tuning that vibration through music and comedy at a time when things were starting to get very more difficult in the world I would say the world was at a different place when we started doing this show it was a little bit of a more fun time and the needs were more artistic or it wasn't just my own dissatisfaction with comedy, but the group of people that started, which was an amazing group that included um, Bob Odenkirk, David Cross, Dana Gould, Andy Dick, Andy Kindler, Bob Goldthwaite, Jeannie Garofalo, Judy Toll, Taylor Negron. Um, I know I'm forgetting, Kathy Griffin, uh, the, the original group of On Cabaret was so astounding and they were frustrated in the comedy clubs and um, were coming off HBO shows and Saturday Night Live. It wasn't people starting up, it was people whose sense of expression was very being very stifled. And that's, um, and, and it was in an expansionist time. And when Mitch and I started doing the show, we needed to sort of accordion it in a little bit. And, um, you know, that's natural. Things breathe in and out. So uh, it's really Mitch helped the show evolve into, you know, where it is now through his, you know, it was, and we would talk about stuff. It would be like we would put our tastes together. But Mitch, wouldn't you say that was sort of what happened? That was how, that was Absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah. so Mitch, I wanted to ask you, so what was your instinct to, rather than do playtime with Mitch and Beth, but to go back to, or go forward with Cabaret, on Cabaret, a new version of on Cabaret? I had an intuition that on Cabaret, bringing it back could become a big success. And um, that really excited me. I. I I had had experience, as you had spoken about, at the back lot, a Monday night at the back lot, which showcased up and coming and established talent. And um, I thought that we could bring something to, that LA needed at that time. That would be really fun, having a alternative comedy show with music. And it was such a great the venue and space to do it in. Yeah. So that was exciting for me. I mean, you know, it's really funny now that we're in this time to um, to really give it up to the venues who are struggling now because a venue really does help shape a show, whatever theater you're in. Um, there's a great introduction to the the CBGB book, CBGB's book that um, 
I think David Byrne wrote, that talks about how the architecture of a room really shapes the music, that the long thinness of CBGBs actually helped define the musical quality of the, that came out of that room. And I would say that the intimacy of First and Hope really helped, and it was a beautiful space. It was a really beautiful space. We were both inspired by the space, I have to say. Don't you think, honey? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the space was amazing. And we shot that, that package that you showed was from the Amazon shows. Uh, we did four episodes for Amazon, and those were shot in, in the First and Hope space. So um, moving along, trying to cover as much ground as possible, uh, uh, you did a... Um, 25th anniversary show recently and as opposed to being in the, the what was what was first in hope maybe 75 seats maybe 100 yeah uh, definitely i mean packed 100. it was like 100 was packed packed, you know. packed packed yeah which it often was and um and here you found yourself downtown at a 1600 seat theater wasn't it 18 so, 1800 18. seat theater also packed and this time you had a lineup of uh sandra you had sandra there mm -hmm. a lot of the people you just named bob odenkirk and uh Marie Patton Bansford, Oswald, Patton Oswald. And, uh julia sweeney um anyway we have we uh have a little video clip of that incredible night let's look at that Uncab was about being yourself, you know, and, and talking about what really happened to you or what you thought or felt. And I discover that people like me better when I'm not myself. <laughs> Nothing tastes as good as feeling good feels. <laughs> Shut the fuck up, Maria. I'm not trying to get cut or fit. I just want to stop my chin from melting into my chest and forming a neck boob. That's really all I want to stop doing. So now, get covering 25 plus years as quickly as we can, this brings us to what I really wanted today to be about, is how you have reinvented on Cabaret for these modern, crazy, wacky, horrible, interesting, inspiring times that we're in now by putting them on Zoom, which is something that you um, you did almost immediately. I mean, yeah. I, I remember uh, that we got the, um, the word from the governor on March 12th that we weren't allowed to have gatherings over 100 people anymore. And I remember the three of us were all in Palm Springs for separate reasons on that Saturday night. And we drove back that Saturday night, the 14th, and basically, starting the next day, that was it. Our, our live performance careers were over for the last, what is it now, almost seven months. And, um, and when, when was it that you put it, the first one on Zoom? It seems like you put, got that together very quickly. March 29th. There you go, within two weeks, right? Yeah. Yeah. So tell me what that has been like for you. It's been amazing. It's been a huge re like rebirth. I mean, it's been so Uncapper has always been an experiment, and um, it took and and I I'm excited to do it this way. I mean, two of the words that really define Uncapper are intimacy and conversation. It, that is how I describe the comedy. And so Zoom was a very natural fit for us. And um, I've always, you know, loved the talk show format. And I've, you know, I had an MTV talk show that went for a second. And um, I had radio, hosted radio shows, of course. And uh, Mitch and I did a podcast for a while. And I love talk. I mean, I love talk as an art form. So it, it made so much sense for us. And um, we're very mission-oriented, community, and it, 
people, we felt people needed it. It didn't, it wasn't like, oh God, I have to be on stage or I'm going to die. You know, it was just like, this is a necessary thing. And it's, uh, I felt called to do it. And I immediately said, let's, let's try it. And it was a very, let's try it. Let's wing it. And, um, and we missed our community of friends. Yeah. It was a way to see people. I mean, it was been a great, I mean, it was fun at the very beginning. The first one was successful enough to keep going. And we also gathered a team almost immediately to help us in terms of tech. Emily, you know, Emily and Joseph have, were both came through Facebook. It was a sort of a Facebook miracle. They both popped up and were like, hey, if you happen to need help making this better, I can know, you know, I know how, and uh, I'm not a creep. And they were, you know, and, and that just happened. So it's been, we're on show 15 now. Well, when we're recording this, when you're seeing this, we're on show 1000 and running on Netflix. Um, <laughs> but, but as, as we record this here, um, we're about, we're getting ready for show 15. Um, we're doing it twice a month. Let's so take I, a look at a little video of the beginnings of the zoom present, uh, additions. Be the last man dancing. After 27 years of groundbreaking comedy, Uncabaret has finally landed on Zoom. Hey guys! Uh, That's a big one! So <laughs> <laughs> I have already in this month gained the COVID-19, much like the freshman 15. And, uh, <laughs> it's pretty disgusting. I'm losing it. I'm Are losing it. Are you losing it. it? Yeah, of course. This is fucking nuts. I love it. The internet will be like, we can help you make your penis bigger. <laughs> and I feel like maybe they know more about me than I know about myself. <laughs> Hey man, I uh, I always love to hear you drumming. Cool, cool. And I like that uh, hibiscus in your hair. Thanks, man. And people were so angry about losing Gone with the Wind for like a week. They took it off of streaming services. But that movie is like, first of all, it's really boring. It's so long. <laughs> so long. She makes a dress from curtains. No, it's so long. Prove yourself. He hates all people who are minorities unless they play on the offense of the Philadelphia yeah. Eagles. Nobody appreciates me. If you have to zoom, you don't have to groom. That's. The <laughs> I feel sad coming out of that, Lapidus. Oh. <laughs> this is how. The, uh, but I kind of like it. It's hell, and I like it. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the Zoom life of uh, Uncabaret. You, you've got sort of a, a, a collection of regulars that are there pretty, pretty often. You've got full production numbers from Alec Mamba, <laughs> which is hilarious. <laughs> yes. And with his backgrounds and his yes. props and his stories. Yes. And his uh, true confessions about Morgan Cheryl, Ch Fairchild and the like. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and Julia Sweeney is often with you. And um, Alex, Alex Edelman. Edelman. Tell me about, tell me, uh, what's Alex Edelman's story? He's so hilarious. I had never heard, I got, I first saw him, I guess maybe it was at the 25th anniversary show, but when he talked about the um, finding his way into the uh, uh, anti-Semite yeah. uh, gathering. Oh, and yeah. how his mm -hmm. girlfriend said, you're so entitled. You think <laughs> that story is so brilliant. So anyway, good. so how, how is it that you focused on this? Sir? What do you look for in your end cabaret performers? Variety. I don't look for the same thing in every peep in every person. Um, the ability to come up with a lot of new material for sure. I mean, those four people that we have all the time, Alex and Alec and Julia and Jamie are just are not, they're just, they generate, they just generate material. You know, there's not, 
they don't come up dry. They're not working from an act. Um, they've got great storytellers. Um, you know, and Jane nice is an people. Interesting, and Jane nice, is an I, can interesting I just say this? Character. Okay, but also nice people. I, I just really love working with people that are, we really like. And that's one big factor. Yeah, you know, Jane, it, it's worth taking a minute to mention. Um, Jamie is an interesting character because I think she comes to this sort of the the least experienced, right? She was sort of a newcomer who, if I'm not mistaken, didn't she come through classes that you teach? You, yeah. You, yeah. yeah, we became, and I, I I have a very strict rule. Like, I mean, I'm a te when I teach, I'm like, I have very clear boundaries. Like, don't become friends with your students because it's really hard to teach them. And, you know, I love you, but I'm your teacher. And, um, and, and Jamie was the, was the one She who has broke, really risen through the ranks, but she's very, she's very clever. She is. And she's clever, and, and we have a script that we're working on together, and um, and uh, she's she's a really not just clever, but deeply. Um, Mitch, I mean, Mitch and I have just sat with her for so many hours. Just she could just tell stories from now until infinity. I mean, she just like just like oh, you need more story. She's just like story girl. Like I, I'm. But it's funny though that as I understand it. Um, she has a daughter who's sort of a rising rock star who gets quite a lot of press and quite a lot of attention, and yet still, her her uh, point of view as a as a sarcastic observant mother is it, it doesn't it's like it doesn't even matter that the daughter is becoming a star. It's the mother's observations about her that are so funny. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, on our show, if you go to Phoebe's show, that's not the case. <laughs> and I mean, Phoebe's amazing. I mean, I, Phoebe has done on Cabaret. Phoebe did on Cab before Phoebe was uh, where she is now. She, Mitch and I, there, Variety did a story about Jamie doing on Cabaret because Jamie's Phoebe's mom, and it was called "The Mom Also Rises." And there's a picture of Mitch and Jamie and Phoebe and Phoebe. I. Um, yeah, from when Phoebe was doing on Cab before she was, you know, before she was as big as she is now. So you don't have as many musical guests in the Zoom. I know you did a little bit at the beginning, but music does tends to not work as well. You do, you do instrumentals with your. You've kept the band. Uncabaret has a band that's always been with it live, and and interestingly enough, you get the whole band together and give each one of them. Uh, a, a segment to play instrumentals, which is always cool. You got Chris on guitar and Lewis on sax and Denise on drums, and everybody gets their own little uh, segments. But but you're not having as many uh, musical guests anymore, right? Tell me about that, Mitch. That might change very soon. We've had um, requests from our viewers to bring back a few more solo musical artist so it is not you know i'm i'm obviously a fan of the music i like music um, it doesn't just, always work as well it's trickier you need special people who can just produce themselves at home and can ac and accompany themselves right but we we will have some more of those yeah those. we will uh, and so we have that, mitch i mean it's not like we don't have music we have mitch yeah always, you got you know. mitch um, and aside from the regulars that I just sort of focused on, you also do, because the Zoom format makes it easier for people to come from all over the place, you've had Sandra, you've had Margaret yeah. Cho, you've had Isaac Mizrahi, he's, he's sort of an undiscovered, hilarious... Uh, yeah. performer, Personality. Right? Amazing, yeah. yeah. So he's been so much fun. It's been great. I mean, it's been great. Judy Gold, who's on the East Coast, has um, been with us a bunch. Kate Willett, who is a New York comedian who I really like, has been with us a bunch. Some of the, you know, comedians like Jen Kirkman, who we really like, who was in the Amazon show. Um, she's on the, you know, in the day, she w we would try to find a date, Jen and I, for her to do Uncap, but she was just on the road so much. There was just a really hard to find dates for people a lot of times. And so we've been able to do that. And we've been able to get to know some people that we didn't know. So it's been really, it's been a blessing, been amazing. I heard somebody mention, I, don't, I can't remember how it came up, but the other night you were saying that if the day comes that we are able to go back to live performances in venues, 
if you would continue to offer a Zoom version, because it is sort of its own uh, creation, really. Yeah, people have asked that because there are people we, I mean, not only do we have performers from everywhere, but of course now our viewers are, you know, national and international. We get letters from Europe and I, we have people waking up early in Germany and, um, you know, we will, uh, my intention is to do it as long as it's interesting and vital and uh, expansive and growing and not a plateau and not stale. And um, I do love it. And I... I love it in a way, I, somebody sent me pictures of the live show today and I was surprised at how how much it like hurt in my heart to see those because I'm like, the Zoom shows are great, I like them better. They're more fun, they're more interesting, I, they're more interesting to me. I just watch, what we're starting to actually do is rerun the Sunday show on Monday on Facebook so that East Coast people can see it. I'm rerunning it at 7.30 Eastern time. And oh, I watch it and I watch it with people and then I'm in the chat room and I can chat with people and, you know, be watching and chatting. And it's super fun. It was really fun. And well, um, I was just going to ask you, do you do you put the whole two hours up anywhere? Like, does it live on YouTube or do that you, was the no, we don't let it li live anywhere, you, but we did rerun like, it. You do we little do, highlights. Yes. Yes. We reels, started. Right? In fact, Jamie's son, Jackson, who you see with Jamie every show. Uh, he's our editor. Keep it in the family, kids. Keep it in the family. And um, and so we've been doing those, and that's great. It gives people a taste. But I, I don't think it's right to just put a whole live show up on YouTube. I mean, it's being there. But I, I love the idea we're rerunning it for the East Coast people so they get a chance to see it. Um, and then we take it down. Now, you know, another thing that's been interesting to me, and I, I, I'm, I'm interested, uh, I want to hear you talk about it, the, how the bu business model has evolved over the last little bit, because um, fundamentally, you do it for free, you do it for art, it, you know, it's, it, it's up there for people that want to see it. But over the course of time, You've also created a merchandise stream and a donation stream, and now you actually are hooked up through Eventbrite, where you sell different tiers of tickets, including the perk of an after show. So tell us a little bit about that. Oh, it's super fun. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm a sort of a socialist, I guess you would say, from each according to their ability to each according to their need. And uh, I love that it's free and available for anybody who needs it and wants it. And, you know, it's there for free. And that's really important to me. And um, but other people are super happy to support and have the ability to support. And we have some angels and people come in at every level. We have people coming for free every week and we have people paying one hundred dollars. I mean, not as many people are paying one hundred dollars as coming for free. But and it works out. Um, and so we made the VIP after party, which Jamie hosts uh, as a, a as an angel and VIP perk, and it's fun. It, I love it because it's, it's a, one thing that was weird is okay, so it's like leave meeting and meeting for all, and then like it goes blank, and then Mitch and I like stare at each other through the ring light and go like, oh, Mitch will go, oh, it was a really good show, you did great, and I was like, yeah, thanks, you too, and then we're like, okay, let's clean up. And then you have to like break it down and it's, you know, so it was really actually, it's like a very, it was a very nice addition for us to have the after party is like a green room kind of experience. And it was great for the audience because it's more interactive. And we've had um, Joseph, who's our sound guru, is an amazing musician himself. And he plays a, like a lullaby every night. He's the most beautiful voice and a guitar player. And his songs are so beautiful. And we've had people show their art and we've had people show articles they've done and so it's a little bit show and tell and Jamie's you know riffing on everything and I'm ordering dinner and it's you know just super fun um, so that's been nice and and we made the different levels so people could contribute and feel part you know people wanted to contribute and are happy to contribute and we made it easy you can do it on Venmo you can do it on PayPal you can do it through Eventbrite um, you can do it through Apple Pay I mean just whatever you want give what you can and it's enough so that performers are making some money and we're able to support the show I mean no one you do give the money to the performers right unless they say please don't which some of them do because you know right. Uh, but, you know, uh, and, you know, so there you go. Um, you know, um, 
That was another thing that I want to commend you for when you did your 25th anniversary show. Uh, you know, that was a, a, a nice ticket price on that. And there was a huge, big audience. And you uh, paid everybody. Pay, Mitch had a big band, like what, seven, seven Nine. pieces? Nine, Nine pieces. pieces. I'm like, why are we crazy? It's a comedy show. Why do we need all these people? I Mitch know. was like, well, Mitch we got need his these. Cues in. Yeah, he got his. And, and uh, they wrote. He Mitch wrote original music for that whole show because yeah, it was in fantastic. the you know the idea of you know we're going to be able to edit it together and sell it and you know yeah we that didn't little have to. that little clip we showed from the anniversary show that could double for you as your dancer reel as well in addition <laughs> to your comedy reel you could also use it to show folks. Well, you know what? Can I say something that was funny? Because you don't get any time at something like the Ace. So Mitch wrote this beautiful music, and they weren't long. They were stings, but it was actually such a short distance. We didn't really realize this from the the wings to the thing right. that it was like, oh, okay, just, I, <laughs> it's like a dance break. All right, let's go. <laughs> so, all right, well, so let's go back to the uh, not the beginning, but I guess it's the middle point. Uh, I want to talk about, you mentioned the show that we all worked on 100% uh, uh, happy, 88% of the time. Yeah. Uh, who is this Beth Lapidus aside from Uncabaret? And, um, you know, when we all did first meet, you know, I, I thought that there was something very epic about the combustion of me, who I consider myself sort of the king of cabaret, you know, meeting the uh, high priestess of, cap of the uncabaret, I thought, well, what could happen? You know, we got the polarity here. So um, that, brought, that brought us together, and you and Mitch wrote songs and musicalized segments, and, you know, it was a very heavy dollop of your, your narrative and your philosophy and your Pity, your pithy and your pity uh, <laughs> and your pity, your all your self pity. Your, it was your, all up there. Your, your insightful <laughs> observations, and we were a, quite a little hit in the the club world of Los Angeles. We ran for what about a year and a half in various four years, twelve years, <laughs> twelve years. And uh, so I, I I have a little demo package of that. I just wanted to show because. Okay. Uh, I'm very proud of it, and I thought you were amazing, and oh, it, it really you. showed. It sh you know, one of the, you know, when you, when you actually, I'll say this, it might sound weird to say, but I think it's good to say, one of the only things, one of the only sacrifices of, of that you have rededicated yourself to the reinvention of on Cabaret is that um, I miss having an hour and a half of just Beth, you know, because... Yeah. An hour and a half of Beth is pretty great, pretty nice. satisfying. Thank you. So um, uh, here, here's this video. Fade in. Exterior. Los Angeles. Night. Amazing. Uplifting. Just what I needed to hear. Oh. You know, we used to have a policy, no crying fits after midnight. But that is just not realistic anymore. <laughs> Despite what the self-help books tell you, you can't be 100% happy 100% of the time. But you can be 100% happy 88% of the time. If you're willing to be 100% unhappy 12% of the time. Wow, we had a blast. We're laughing, we're looking at each other going, yeah, she's right, and then my toe is tapping the entire time. Evicted? What? You say that you're fine, you're out of your mind, you better admit it. You're on a third date with someone you hate, you better admit it. You better admit it, I don't wanna. You better admit it, I don't have to. Oh, I don't think so. I love the way she combines humor with this really hilarious, insightful commentary that we can all relate to. Gotta change, gotta change, gotta Whoa. change, gotta Whoa. change, gotta change, gotta change, Whoa. gotta change. Breakthroughs are really possible, especially now. And if you don't 
believe me, perhaps you'll believe NASA, who's taken this picture of a plane breaking through the sound barrier. <laughs> Funny. That was awesome. We loved it. It was during this period that I formulated one of the primary axioms of Hollywood math. The absence of yes over time equals no. <laughs> Gotta move. Your angels want me to tell you no dairy. <laughs> okay. And your angels want me to tell you, you can't smoke anything, nothing. Can I drink? Yes, your angels say you can drink. I thought that gave the angels more credibility. At least they weren't against partying per se. <laughs> and then he tells me that we have two vortexes on our property and a stargate in our bedroom. <laughs> that I knew. Now you have to tell me. Oh, you have a huge psychic dagger in your back. Forget about Kansas. We're not even in Oz anymore. We're all being evicted. Individually, you know, from houses and jobs and lifestyles, but also collectively evicted from the Newtonian network, Newsian, petroleum filling up in Piscean age into the much more fluid and mysterious Aquarian quantum field. Oh my God, the shift is really hitting the fan. <laughs> God, if anyone ever asks me why I'm so overdressed, I tell them I'm on my way somewhere better. <laughs> and then I go somewhere better. 100 percent happy, 88 percent of the time. You know, watching that just makes me realize how much we, we accept you now as that, that, that musical comedy star, Beth Lapidus. <laughs> oh Whereas we, we, when, the, when that first began, the first time the three of us sat down and Mitch and I were like, and then you're going to sing. And you're like, I don't sing. Okay. So you should sing more. Call? Clifford said you should sing more. And I was like, I, I, I don't, I think the New York Times would disagree with you. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you, and yet you open and close every end cabaret with Change, a song. Yeah. yeah, the song. Well, we, we, Mitch plays it at the end. I only sing it once. I think that will really suffice. You know, <laughs> sometimes I look like I'm a singer and people say, are you a singer? And I say, well, I'm a comedian who's, you know, I'm a comedian. I wish I was a singer. I loved, I mean, it's singing. The singing that I've done with you guys, I mean, it has brought me so much joy and uh, I've done my best to grow my skill in that area and there's nothing more wonderful than sitting and listening to Mitch play music except when I get to sing, which is, you know, not that often. And I've gotten better, but I would, you know, I, mean, I have a, a certain amount of skill and I try to use what I have. Mitch, do you have any observations about that evolution as a singer? Well, I'm impressed that you got Beth to sing Gotta Move. That's right. <laughs> At my annual Barbra Streisand party, I, everybody always sings a Barbra Streisand song. So we, uh, we besieged Beth to, uh, to pick a Barbra Streisand song, and she, um, and she delivered it, baby. Yeah. Uh, well, I worked hard at that one. I did. I did. Well, we had a story that went with it. You know, I always feel like, okay, well, you know, the story was about moving, so it connected, and I could be funny in it, and um, 
Then remember at the other Barbara Streisand show, I, I, I sang a song I think of now, which is Ding Dong, The Witch is Dead, which is a, a deep cut, a deep Barbara <laughs> Streisand cut. I remember, you may not remember this. You said, will you sing in the thing? I was like, I don't know. I don't think so. Barbara Streisand, I have mixed feelings, whatever. And, um, I, you know, I, I don't think I, I'm up to it. And you said, yeah, 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 you can. I said, all right, pick a song. And I was like, all right, what about people? And you just laughed so hard. You were like, yeah. You're not singing. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, well, what about Rain on the Parade? <laughs> <laughs> and you were like, no, honey, no, 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 no. Let, let's look a little deeper. And so then that's when we found Gotta Move, and it was so perfect for the show. That's Actually, right. And it ended yeah. up being featured in the show, it yeah. had being an important element of the show. Gotta Move. Um, you know, I, I did want to mention, um, it came up with when talking about Jamie, but, uh, you know, because a large element of what 100% happy 88% of the time was, was your writing, I did want to say that you do pursue writing. You've written books, you write I don't just pursue it, I do you, it. I exactly. have, I've, I've published, I've, I've uh, published in many magazines, uh, oh, and time and uh you know i had a column for many not many years but a couple of years called my other car is a yoga mat that was in, in nationally syndicated and right. um i've written for npr commentated on all things considered and i've you know i've written scripts and i've written i have a book of haiku called did i wake you haiku for modern living and uh of course i have some unproduced screenplays and i'm actually writing a uh, an original audio book right now that it will be out next year um i'm super excited about and uh and i just you know for the people that will watch and i know how people are when they see a show like this you you do do teach right you do um have, i do mm -hmm. yeah i have classes uh, do we have a yeah it's and not called infinite writing anymore though it's not. Oh, mm -hmm. I just stole that from your. Now Facebook. it's back to the back to uh, the Beth Lapidus workshop. I've oh, okay. gone under many names. I've I've taught under many names. The Uncab Lab. Anyway, I teach. They can find me. Um, it's you know what I love about teaching. It's like a puzzle for me. I don't teach a course. I just I teach a teach a workshop, and the right people always find me. And I see people's lives change. And uh, I just come ready to meet students where they are with everything that I know. And it's been really interesting doing that on Zoom, too. Uh, people have made huge breakthroughs. It's super focused. We, you know, I have 10 people in each session. And um, anyway, it's been interesting. It's, you know, it's, I think of it as a very productive hobby. <laughs> you know, so another thing I want to say to you um, by way of a compliment uh, is, um, my work in the cabaret world is 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 related in a way to what you do in terms of that we both you know focus on a person a person's personality being the source of what they uh, what their art becomes mm -hmm. and you know so I you know I feel that I have a certain something that I know when I look at people and when I comment on people and being around you over these last many years, any time I've ever been in a situation where it's been your position to be the teacher or your position to be the director or your position to give the feedback, I'm always, always, always amazed at just how unique and clear and precise and clever and off a frame of that nobody else has your Thank perceptions you. are. So you Thank have a very rare talent in that. I used to play teacher as a child. It's uh, part of my... I did. I had a little blackboard. When other kids were playing house, I played teacher. And uh, I do feel it's part of my, my mission, if you will. When I started doing yoga and people kept thinking I was a yoga teacher and I kept saying, I'm not. I swear, I'm not a yoga teacher. But then I, I, I tried teaching one class and I really wasn't. <laughs> my, <laughs> But I did write about it. But thank you. Um, you know, I think it, as an artist, you know, I think teachers who are also, I guess, you know, you, you would be in this category. And um, 
and Mitch, you know, does some limited amount of uh, teaching. And we all do, you know, when you're a working artist and you're also teaching, it's different than studying with somebody who's not a working artist because you're always bringing what's it's super fresh for you. You know, you're always bringing what's fresh and um, you're coming at it from an inside the experience kind of. Uh, I, and I, you know, I do it to the extent where it doesn't drain my own work. Um, and it's, it, you know, you have to give back. You know, part of it is the giving back too and helping another generation. Though I teach adults, it's still helping people come up and being given back everything that I've been given. That's a part of teaching. I mean, you once you know, once you have this information in your, you just have this information. I mean, I will eventually do like a, a you know, a master class kind of thing. But um, until then, I just, I teach and I watch people grow, and it's a little like gardening. Um, all right. Now, I, I want to go back to Mitchie here for a second. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I consider Mitch like one of my very closest, most long-term friends. And, um, yes. and we met on stage at the back lot at Studio One, and we That's recently, right. last year, had a very exciting experience that... Uh, our friends Lloyd Coleman and uh, Gary Steinberg and Chris Isaacson and Mark Saltarelli are producing a movie, a documentary about the very famous uh, dance club, um, Studio One. And within the dance club was, was the, the most prestigious nightclub in Los Angeles at the time, the back lot. And, um, and I, I went with my my little Barry Manilow songbook, you know, and went to the an open mic there. There was a very prestigious open mic that was very hard to get into. Jane Oliver's sister ran it, and um, and uh, that's how I met my pal Mitch many, many I I just have to say decades ago, and uh, we're closer than ever. And uh, yes, I sang you and I, and. Um, Anyway, so uh, Mitch, you're you're um, you're working on a new project now. You're uh, tell us about your Erasure project. I'm the musical director for a a new musical being created now, and it's a a jukebox musical that incorporates the music of the pop band Erasure. You might remember Erasure from. They had some hits in the late 80s, the 90s, a little respect, chains of love. And my friend Paul Lavoy, he wrote an original book and um, he's created this amazing project, which I'm so excited and honored to be part of. And so we've been in the studio uh, the last month and a half recording tracks, all the songs, and having the cast come in and create a cast album. And it's um, uh, been, been amazing. That's so exciting. Uh, so I have a video I want to share. One of, one of the happiest days of my life was when I got to be a musical guest at Uncabaret. Uh, you know, I, I began my career a thousand years ago as a singer, although I, it's not something I really pursue in the front, on the front burner that much anymore. But um, I have a very special bond whenever I have the opportunity to sing with Mitch. And, um, and you know, ordinarily I'm not the type of act that they would have at Uncabaret. They usually have original artists and more alternative and, you know, I'm a more theatrically type shunters. And, um, but because of my long friendship with Mitch and the connection that we have one night, one of their acts, a big act that you had uh, a, a big juicy spot for in the show, was stuck in the studio and couldn't make it. And Mitch came up to me right before the show started and said, let's sing tonight. I'm like, what? You know, packed out, blah, 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 blah. So anyway, we, we pulled out this song that Mitch wrote that's always been one of my favorite songs. Wow. And it's, it's, it's got funny synchronicity to it now because in this Studio One documentary, one of the featured 
performers that you'll see is Thelma Houston, who did a lot of performances back in the day. And Thelma Houston was one of the only people who has done an official studio recording released on an album of this song Mitch wrote called Take Me Through Your Lifetime. And then Sam Harris, who's also in the Studio One documentary, uh, it was one of the songs he won Star Search with back in the day. And then I love the song so much that um, I use it as the theme song for this podcast. So if you notice uh, at the beginning and the end of the show, we have Mitch playing an instrumental of this song. But um, this is a night, it, this is not the night that we were on at, at Uncabaret, but we were at Rockwell one night and Mitch and I did this. And so I thought I would share it just because it has meaning to me. So I hope you enjoy it.
Mitch Kaplan. Well, I really wanted to share that because uh, I, I just wanted you all to hear Mitch's beautiful music. Um, Thank you, Clifford. Thank you so uh, much. You know, as I said, I met Mitch long ago, and, and in, in my many, 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 many years in L.A., in New York, in show business, in music, I, I don't think I've ever known anybody that was a more talented writer uh, than, than Mitch. He's just I'm such a huge fan. And Thank you. I just love my Mitchie. I love you, Our Clifford. Mitchie, I guess, Beth, right? Um, all right. Well, I believe we've come to the end of our time together. Can, Thank you. Can guys. I add one more thing quickly? Yes, please. Um, the creator of the Erasure musical would want me to add this. The name of the project is Ola Moore. So keep your eyes and ears open for it. It'll be coming soon. Ola Moore. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So thank you guys. Thank you so much for. Um, Zooming with me today. Thanks so for much having fun to us. Thank you. Yeah. yeah it's so great to spend the extra. You know, we all are, we're all so crazy busy, even in these, even in these broken down, crazy ass times. It's Especially because everything takes so much longer. Everything you were going to do before, you still. Have to, I mean, it's just everything is more complicated. Yeah. So um, let's see. I, there's uh, one thing I want to promote. My friend Michael Collum and I, Michael Collum and I, Michael Collum is a, is a great pianist who also by day is a very big time um, divorce lawyer. So, you know, it's, it's so funny. I'll be, we'll be singing some song, working on some song, and, um, and he'll say, oh, I have to take this, and he'll grab his phone and he'll say, wire me $25,000 by the morning. <laughs> like, I, I say, you're the only person who takes calls like that in the middle of rehearsal. <laughs> but you, you just go right ahead and do that. Um, anyway, so uh, we're all so frustrated. You know, we were so frustrated not being able to do anything. So we decided to have a, to start a little cabaret series online that we're calling Virtually Yours. And we did it, uh, we did one last month and then we're gonna do the next one this month. Um, with Michael and Rena Strober, who is a great Broadway gal. She just made an album with uh, Jason Alexander and Mary Bogue, who is a great jazz singer and a hot mama singer. And, um, and that's going to that's gonna go online on um, October 30th. And we film it in Michael's backyard and then you know audience and then put it online. So that's a fun little thing. Um, and uh, thank you so much. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, thank Mitch. You. Thanks thank to you. my co-producer and friend Andrew Apple for running the tech on this thing. There are so many screens in this room where I am. It's like it's a miracle we got got it all happening at once. Um, and we'll we'll go out to a few little more highlights from the the Zoom sessions. But with that, we'll say goodbye and we'll see you next month. Bye bye. Thanks, Clifford. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Today they they did finally dig up the back taxes, and uh, I was kind of upset to see that I spent more on therapy <laughs> about Trump's presidency <laughs> than he paid in taxes. That's what it comes down to. If you never argued with your significant other in the wilderness. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's something, um, it's something, it's something old school about it. Cause where the fuck you gonna go? You know, <laughs> it ain't like you can leave the house and go to a bar or nothing. No, it is animals outside roaming free. Finally, Michael agreed to stay in an RV park and we did for two nights. Was that good? No. I, okay, <laughs> I, I thought, I thought I would like it, but it's like, you're right next to another RV and they have their big flat screen TV. And it's like, why don't you just stay home? You know, I can have this experience at home. Why are you dragging your home out here? Well, listen, everybody's talking about camping and going on all these adventures. And uh, I'm also in the wild, Beth. I'm in a senior community. In <laughs> Florida. I mean, 
it's not, yeah, Judaism, religion, it's just, it's not good. It's not good enough, right? <laughs> it's sort of like, um, it's sort of like a streaming series on Netflix. Like it's, yeah, you know, you could, yeah, you know, really need to see the whole thing. It's like Russian doll or something, right? Like, yeah, it was good. It was all right. But that's how I feel about religion. Religion is just like Russian doll, just about as good as Russian doll. <laughs> we keep passing the same couple and, and this guy, and he finally comes up to us and he's like, uh, you know, he's got this Southern drawl, but I can't do accents. And he's like, J just want to know, like, um, you guys look so much alike. Like, are you sisters? Which is like the worst thing you can say to lesbos. It's like a nightmare. So I was like, no, I was like, no, 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 no. I was like, no, I was like, no, 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 no. We're partners. And he literally, Beth, he literally said, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I did not know you were a cheerleader. You know, I was a basketball cheerleader too for the Jewish Center. Beep, beep. Ungala, the JCC's got the power. Beep, beep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm troubled. I'm troubled. It's a little itchy. It gets itchy when you do that. I'm sorry. <laughs> tell Aaron that um, what I really want from Aaron is when they say, are you sisters? You're, I mean, I want, of course, what I want isn't important, but I want you to say, we're not sisters, we're fucking. 